with uh, Professor Inhorn, who is uh, visiting us from Yale. Professor Inhorn has spent her uh, entire career uh, studying uh, Middle Eastern peoples and religion, uh, as well as gender relations and the socio-political and economic realities of the region. She is uh, perhaps uh, the world's authority on the topic that she's going to be presenting. She's written over five books and hundreds of articles. We're very, very happy uh, to have uh, Professor Inhorn here uh, to discuss uh, the quest for conception, uh, infertility, and assisted reproduction in the Muslim world. Please welcome uh, Dr. Inhorn to the podium. Thank you so much. I have to say, I, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you to Mustafa Ahmed, who's basically brought together a really wonderful day. And thank you for coming on a Saturday. Not a home football game, I understand, right? But anyway, it's great to have so many people here. And I have to say, my talk is going to follow so well from Professor Musa's talk and Professor um, Williams. Is it William? Yeah. Miller, Miller's talk, I'm sorry. But there is going to be a lot of, I think, intersection you'll see between my topic and the, the earlier presentations today. So, um, you know, just what I'm going to cover, I'm going to be talking about infertility as a global reproductive health issue, and I'm really glad to see that your center is the Center for Global Islamic Studies. I am going to take us around the globe a little bit. Then I want to talk about the global, globalization of assisted reproductive technologies with in vitro fertilization or IVF being the kind of base technology. And then I will take you to the part of the world where I've done most of my research, which is the Muslim Middle East. And we already have had a great sort of entree to the divisions or the sort of differences between Sunni and Shia Islam. But we're going to talk about differences of opinion surrounding assisted reproduction, uh, specifically with regard to third party reproductive assistance, which will become clear and then to explore patterns of so-called reproductive tourism or movement of people between uh, countries in the Muslim world trying to access these various technologies. So just to give you a sense that infertility is really still a major global reproductive health issue, there have been three major studies over the past decade, very different um, estimates based on sort of differences in the studies, but there are as many as 186 million infertile people in the world. In any society, it's sort of said, well, somewhere between 8 and 12 percent of couples will be unable to have a child. And so 9 percent is the current global average. But there are parts of the world, including vast parts of the Muslim world, with very high prevalence rates of infertility, where as many as one third of all couples are going to have difficult, difficulty trying to conceive a child especially areas with so-called um, secondary infertility problems where there's infection after a woman has given birth or been pregnant, but then infection because it becomes a cause of infertility. And where are the global hot spots? They tend to be in Muslim dominant parts of the world. Right now in rank order, South Asia has got the most infertility that would include India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka followed by Sub-Saharan Africa, which um, has just been pushed into second position. But we know that there are vast parts of Central and Southern Africa that have very high infertility prevalence rates. And it's been called the infertility belt um, of the sort of center of Africa. The Middle East and North Africa, where I'm going to be talking about today, um, Central and Eastern Europe, and then Central Asia, the large countries which are mostly Muslim, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and so forth. Um, and, you know, has IVF as a technology, we're talking about, you know, the movements of technology around the globe, and I really think Dr. Musa brought this up, it's been very uneven, very uneven dispersion of global technologies. And it, over time, it's gotten better, but still it's not sort of a global saturation. About, what, 13 years ago, only one quarter of the WHO member states were able to perform IVF in the country. That increased five years later to about one-third of the world's nations. And then in 2010, when a major global survey was conducted, um, the authors were happy to say that there's been an explosion in IVF in the developing world and a doubling in the number of countries included in the survey. So about, you know, about one half of the world's nations were able to perform IVF. But, and, and so two regional success stories, um, good for those of us who work in the Middle East, the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, is actually a part of the world where you've got the most robust kind of IVF industry. They looked at the 48 sort of top performing countries in the world, the ones that performed the most IVF cycles per 
million inhabitants, and you see that the MENA region really performed well. Israel, since we've just had a discussion on Halakha and Judaism, Israel is the world's IVF capital. It performs more IVF cycles per capita than any other country in the world, and it's state subsidized. So you have free IVF up to, IVF up to the birth of two children. That is very generous. But still look at Lebanon, Jordan, Tunisia, some of the Gulf states, Egypt, Libya, and the UAE are top performers. And Latin America is Catholic, and we've had a discussion of Catholicism. Catholicism, the Vatican still does not allow any form of reproductive technology, from condoms and contraception to IVF. Um, any kind of reproductive technology is disallowed in Catholicism, yet there's heavy use of IVF in these predominantly Catholic countries. So basically, practice is not following the Catholic theology. So in terms of a regional comparison, um, Asia also doing very well as a region, but the area, let's see if I can use the pointer, the sad area of the world um, is Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it is an area of absence. It's a part of the world that really lacks IVF technology, including many of the large Muslim dominant countries of Africa. And so it is an area where we still have high unmet need and, and very high infertility problems and low numbers of IVF clinics. So it, it has not been an even global dispersion. Now, assisted reproductive technologies in the Muslim Middle East. Um, it may be surprising, but uh, IVF globalized very quickly to the Middle East. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of that. And so today, um, as of right now, these are the number of IVF clinics in some of these countries. Turkey is the leader in the, um, in the Middle East. It has more than 110 clinics. But Iran, which I'll talk about um, today, is also a very IVF-heavy society, followed by Egypt. Um, but even small countries, Lebanon only has about 4 million people, and now more than a million Syrian refugees, sadly. But it has got a very large number of IVF clinics per capita, as do the very small kind of petro-rich countries in the Arab Gulf. And why? Where did it all begin? It actually, for the Muslim world, in a sense, began at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, the very famous Sunni religious institution, where the first world's first test tube baby was born in 1978, Louise Brown, in England. And by 1980, two years later, the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar at that time issued the first authoritative fatwa saying that IVF was permissible for Muslim couples. So by two years later, by 1980, a fatwa emerged. And just to reiterate things that have been said, but Sunni is the dominant branch of Islam. You know, probably 85 to 90% of the world's Muslims are Sunni. By 1980, the first Al-Azhar fatwa was, uh, was published. And so six years later, it took about six years to get the technology to the Sunni Middle East. But the first IVF clinics opened in Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. And in Egypt in 1987, the world's, uh, the Middle East's first IVF baby was born. And so it's been there since the 1980s. And so what is the permission in Sunni Islam? What can you do and what can't you do um, in terms of making an IVF child? First of all, I want to say that this is a long list of permissions. Um, artificial insemination, which is basically taking a husband's sperm and injecting it into the uterus of his wife, is allowed as long as it's within the marriage. In vitro fertilization, which is taking sperm out of a man's body, taking eggs out of a woman's body, putting them together in a petri dish, creating embryos, and putting them back into the uterus of the wife is allowed as long as it's done within that marriage. Intracytoplasmic sperm injection, I always like to ask, does anybody know what that is besides the physicians in the room? No, no one's ever heard of ICSI. It's been around for a long time, since the early 1990s. It is the variant of IVF to overcome male infertility problems, which are very common around the world. ICSI, and it's allowed as long as you're using sperm from a husband, eggs from the wife, and you know putting it back. Cryopreservation, which is the freezing of gametes, sperm, eggs, and embryos, is allowed. And you can use those embryos in a future frozen IVF cycle. This is a 
interesting, now the latest reproductive technology is the ability to freeze human eggs. And now that we have that technology called oocyte cryopreservation, a woman who has frozen her eggs and then later in life goes through menopause can be hormonally stimulated and she can use her frozen eggs from when she was a younger woman. That is allowed as long as she's putting those eggs back into her own body. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, um, Professor Musa talked about genetic you know, modification, but it's okay if you're screening for genetic disease in the embryos to do that, to put healthy embryos back into the wife's uterus. Embryo research to advance science is allowed, again, for you know, the advancement of science. And although this is contentious and we can talk about it, Multi-fetal pregnancy reduction is allowed. It is a form of selective abortion that is used when a large number of embryos are put back into the uterus and all of them or most of them implant and you would end up with what's called a high order multiple pregnancy with you know, quintuplets, quadruplets. It's not a safe pregnancy for the mother or the fetuses. So they go in with potassium chloride, I believe, into the fetal heart and they do a selective abortion of some of the fetuses to reduce the pregnancy usually to twins. And it is being practiced in the Muslim world and we can talk about the attitudes toward abortion in the different Islamic legal schools. And uterine transplantation has now happened. The first IVF babies born from transplanted uteruses have happened in the Nordic countries in Sweden, but it has been tried in Turkey and Saudi Arabia. So taking another woman's uterus, transplanting it, and having a baby. So that's a long list of things that have been allowed in the Sunni sort of religious um, discussions, but there's also a long list of prohibitions. And the one that I should really circle or point to is the top one. Third party donors are not allowed um, in the Sunni sort of, you know, the fatwas and the discourse in the, in the ethics. Why? Thir we're going to talk about why, but that means no donor sperm, no donor eggs, no donor embryos, and no donor uteruses, as in surrogacy. And if you have a donor child or a surrogate child, there's no way to make that child a legitimate child. It belongs to the mother who bore the child. There is no posthumous or post-divorce assisted reproduction. You have to use the embryos within the legal limits of a marriage. And so you can't use embryos if one of the partners has passed away or if there's been a divorce. Sperm banks for the you know, purposes of using donor sperm or egg banks for the purposes of donating eggs to other people, not allowed. And pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or sperm sorting for the purposes of sex selection also not allowed. You should not be selecting the sex of your child beforehand. Similarly, um, you know, embryo alteration, the creation of designer children um, is not allowed. And human reproductive cloning, which we've already heard about this morning, which would be asexual autonomous reproduction, where you would actually use your, your own cells to produce a mini-me. <laughs> not allowed in Islam, and actually there's a worldwide bioethical ban on human reproductive cloning, although there are cloned mammals, including Dolly the sheep. So, you know, this is a sort of list of things that are not considered to be ethical. And Professor Musa has the best quote. <laughs> in terms of ethics, Muslim authorities consider the transmission of reproductive material between persons who are not legally married to be a major violation of Islamic law. This sensitivity stems from the fact that Islamic law has a strict taboo on sexual relations outside wedlock, zinna. The taboo is designed to protect paternity, i.e. family, which is designated as one of the five goals of Islamic law, the others being the protection of religion, life, property, and reason. And so in my work, I'm an anthropologist, and I've actually spent thousands of hours of my research life and my life talking to Muslim couples about why Sunni Muslim couples about why they do not want to bring third party gametes, donor sperm, donor egg, donor embryos into their lives, why they can't do that even if they have a severe infertility problem. And there's sort of three reasons. And the first has to do with marriage, that you know, doing IVF is okay so long as it's within the marital unit. Marriage is the important thing. And people say if you were to take a donor egg or a donor sperm and use it, it's as if you committed adultery. It's as if you brought another person into your marriage. And that is haram. It's not permitted. It's, it's like zinna. It's like an adulterous relationship. And the marriage is an important thing to preserve. 
And this is a very serious problem ethically that's arisen in Western countries where there is a lot of donor sperm, donor egg being used. The potential for future half-sibling incest. Because if you have a man, for example, who has donated, he's donated his sperm many times, and we know that there are men out there who now have more than 100 biological offspring from their donor sperm, those children could grow up, meet each other, fall in love, and marry, not realizing that they're actual half-siblings. And so there are now efforts in the West to try to get these sort of donor registries going so that children have some sense of who their biological half-siblings are. And the Islamic authorities have said, we want to prevent this from happening. We don't want to have this thing from happening. And people believe that you know, incest is a really important moral and ethical problem. And then issues of kinship, descent, and inheritance. A kind of moral imperative in Islam is that there, you keep the lines of genealogy pure, that people should know who their biological father and their biological mother are. And it's especially important because almost all Muslim societies are organized patrilineally. Your sense of identity, inheritance, descent, kinship, you know, flows through the father's line. And so paternity, patrilineality, having a known father and a known grandfather is very, very important. And so people say, look at if you're mixing the genealogic relations, if you're mixing up the lines of descent, it's dangerous, it's forbidden in the religion, it's against nature, it's against God, it's haram, it's, you know, religiously and morally not a good thing to do, it's illicit. <clears throat> and people say, you know, it's like bringing a strange child into your family to take somebody else's child. It says if you have a, you're raising somebody else's son, it destroys the purity of lineage, and it destroys patrilineality. So these are the kind of ways people are thinking about it uh, in the Sunni, you know, majority countries of the Middle East. And getting back to the Islamic Organization of Medical Sciences, you know, based in Kuwait, um, uh, Professor Musa has written about this, but there was a, a conference held in Casablanca, Morocco, um, organized by the IOMS, where a, a sort of a bioethical declaration was written and basically prohibiting third-party reproductive assistance, um, saying that it's unethical um, from the majority Sunni Muslim position. And basically, it's created a kind of ban, a practice ban, a clinical ban across the Sunni world from Morocco to Malaysia Basically, in IVF clinics in the Sunni countries, you will not find IVF doctors performing any form of third-party reproductive assistance. It's reinforced by fatwas, these authoritative, they're not legally binding, but these authoritative religious decrees. And actually, Muslim couples will often go seeking out a fatwa before they come to an IVF clinic to make sure that they're doing the morally correct thing. And so just to say, donor technologies are not practiced in the Sunni Muslim world. You will not find <coughs> donor sperm, donor egg, donor embryo, or surrogacy being performed. And then we move to the Shia Muslim world and talk about the emergence of donor technologies. Um, and you know, geographically, again, the Shia is a major branch, but it's a minority demographically. Probably 10 to 15 percent of the world's Muslims are Shia. The demographic epicenter of Shia is in Iran and the so-called Shia crescent that sort of stretches through parts of South Asia to Lebanon, you know, Syria, Iraq. But we have a book, an edited volume, that brought together about a dozen scholars who've worked on assisted reproductive technologies, looking at the differences between Sunni and Shia Islam. And I want to tell you what happened in the 1990s. And to begin with the sort of Iranian Shia clerical debates, and um, we've heard about the importance of ishtihad, this sort of notion especially valorized among the Shia Muslim community, that if you have a new technology and it, there's nothing written in the scriptures about it, you have to figure out its validity, its permissibility through using sort of independent moral reasoning. And this is what the Shia clergy have done in Iran. And they've come to various opinions about what's right and what's wrong. The majority now of the Shia establishment, they accept the validity of egg donation, taking donor egg from one woman to another. And in 1999, the ultimate fatwa was issued by Ayatollah Ali Hussein al-Khamenei. He is the grand Ayatollah in Iran. He was the hand-picked successor to Ayatollah Khomeini. And he wrote a short but very straightforward fatwa saying it is OK to use both donor egg and donor sperm. And so he really opened the door. He's the only Muslim cleric that I know of who has 
permitted the use of donor sperm, donor sperm technology, but he opened the door in Iran to the use of donor technologies. And so in Iran today, my colleagues and I have written an article saying it's an Iranian ART revolution. I mean, basically, all of the practices that you could find in the West are being practiced in the country of Iran, and this includes, it's become the hub, it's the Muslim donor surrogacy stem cell hub of the Muslim world. In Iran, there's egg donation, there's sperm donation, there's embryo donation, which has actually been put into law in Iran. Gestational surrogacy is practiced in Iran, and um, Excess IVF embryos were the sort of basis for the stem cell industry using human embryonic stem cells. And so Iran has led the way into a Middle Eastern stem cell industry and doing very creative things with um, egg retrieval. I'm actually currently studying this new technology of egg freezing for mostly single women in the Western world who want to preserve their fertility if they're single. And that means that they have to do transvaginal retrieval of the eggs. But in Iran, so that there's no breaking of the virginity, they actually go in and retrieve the eggs through the abdomen. So they're doing very interesting, you know, very interesting new forms of new technologies. And interestingly, my own work has been in Lebanon, which some would say has a Shia majority. Uh, it's a multi-sectarian society, but with a large Shia Muslim population, many of whom follow the clerical leanings that are in Iran. And so Lebanon, um, as soon as egg donation and sperm donation were sort of announced in, in Iran in the very late 1990s, by 2000, the Lebanese were following the Iranian lead. And so in IVF clinics in Lebanon, including those run by Christian Lebanese doctors, you can get anything. You can get egg donation, sperm donation, and they do some surrogacy there as well. So what has this led to? Um, oh, I didn't want that slide in there. Um, it's led to this, the emergence of a phenomenon that has been called reproductive tourism, um, also called fertility tourism, procreative tourism, or cross-border reproductive care is the sort of medical term being used. I actually don't like any of those terms. I don't think it's tourism, and I just call it reproductive travel, or repro-travel for short. It's the traveling by people from one institution, jurisdiction, or country where they can't get the available treatment, to another place where they can obtain the kind of medically assisted reproduction they desire. And it's part of a much larger global phenomenon of medical tourism, people moving across international borders to get things like organs that they can't get in their home country. And so what are the four major drivers? Resource constraints, just not having IVF clinics in large parts of sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Um, quality and safety concerns, that if you're, that your country doesn't have efficacious or safe IVF and so you're going to travel someplace else. Sociocultural concerns, especially surrounding medical privacy, that you don't want to do IVF in your home country, you travel for secrecy. But in the Muslim Middle East, the main driver of travel from one country to another has to do with these religious, legal, and bioethical concerns, especially it is basically the movement of Sunni Muslim couples who know that they are going against the religion, but they've decided that their mar marriage matters to them more, and they're traveling to Lebanon or Iran to access donor technologies. And I, that is what I've studied in my own, you know, my own research. So the concluding thoughts. The Islamic world has clearly embraced ARTs. It's really, ARTs are found in most Muslim societies now. The local religious ma moralities really do matter. People care that they're doing it in the way that they, you know, is religiously permissible, especially I would say the Sunni Muslim world. Most people are very concerned not to use third party donation. But Islam is interpreted locally and it depends on where you are and what the locale is. And what we've seen really in the Sunni world, and I think Professor Musa would agree, there's been a kind of re-entrenchment of this notion of biogenetic inheritance, that you have to have a child biologically connected to you, both the mother and the father. Whereas in the Shia world, it's been a kind of opening to donation and to the notion that you can be a social parent, that you, know, you can have a child that's not biologically connected to both of you, but if you're an infertile couple, you can be a social parent to a donor child. And so this has led to significant reproductive travel to Iran and Lebanon are the two donor hubs that I know of in the, in the Middle East, in the Muslim Middle East. But I just learned that in Mali, which is predominantly Muslim, there is an IVF clinic where they do practice donor technologies in Mali. So um, 
maybe it will become a sort of sub-Saharan African hub for this kind of reproductive travel. We now are seeing the birth of thousands of donor children to Muslim couples. And some of the people that I've spoken with are really beginning to reconsider the whole notion of biological parenthood and what that means. And as a result, I would say that there's been a kind of a weakening of this sort of ethical ban um, in the Sunni world on third party donation. As some Sunni couples are saying, you know, look at, we, we want to do this and we're going to do it and we're going to make our own, um, you know, moral judgments about this. And so we're beginning to see significant movement of Sunni couples to the Shia world, um, where to be, put it in these kinds of terms, Shia donor gametes are making their ways into Sunni bodies. I mean, it's mostly Shia people who are donating their gametes, and Sunni Muslim couples are the ones who are accepting them. And so it can be called a global exchange of gametes in the Muslim world today. And that is where I will end. Thank you. Yeah.